an unnatural foreboding in their countenance, in their mood. In a more confusing way, she sensed it in Childs. Although he was now gone from view, Miss Piprelli shivered. As he returned from the hotel bar with the drinks, weaving his way round the garden tables and chairs, Amy was releasing her hair at the back so that it fell into a ponytail, an old style transformed through her into something chic. There was a subtle elegance to Amy that was inborn rather than studied, and not for the first time Childs thought she looked anything but a schoolteacher, at least not the type who had ever taught him. Her skin appeared almost golden in the shadow of the table's canopy. Her pale green eyes and lighter wisps of hair curling over her ears heightening the effect. As usual, she wore the minimum of makeup, a proclivity that often made her resemble some of the girls she instructed, her small breasts, just delicate swellings, hardly spoiling the illusion. Yet at twenty-three, eleven years younger than himself, she possessed a quiet maturity that he was in just a little wonder of. It was not always evident, for there was also a tantalising innocence about her that enhanced the pubescent impression even more. The combination was often confusing, for she was unaware of her own qualities, and the moods could quickly change. Amy's slender and mockingly desperate fingers reached for the glass as he approached, and early evening sunlight struck her hand, making it glow a lighter gold. "'If only Miss Piprelli knew she had a lush on her staff,' he remarked, passing the gin and tonic to her. She allowed the glass to tremble in her grasp as she brought it to her lips. "'If only Pip knew half her staff were inebriates. And she's the cause.' Child sat opposite so that he could watch her, sacrificing closeness for the pleasure of eye contact. "'Our headmistress wants me to put in more time at the school,' he said, and Amy's sudden smile warmed him. "'John, that would be lovely. I'm not so sure. I mean, yes, great to see more of you, but when I came here I was opting out of the rat race, remember?' "'It's hardly that. This is a different civilization to the one you were used to.' "'Yeah.' another planet. But I've got used to the easy pace, afternoons when I can go walking or diving or just plain snoozing on the beach. At last I've found time to think. And sometimes you do too much thinking. The mood change. He looked away. I said I'd let her know. Humour came back to Amy's voice. Coward? Child shook his head. She makes me feel like a ten-year-old. Her bark isn't as bad as her bite. I'd do as she asks. Some help you are. She placed her glass between them. I'd like to think I am. I know you spend too much time on your own, and perhaps a bigger commitment to the college might be what you need. Well, you know how I feel about commitments. A look passed between them. You have one. To your daughter. He sipped his beer. L let's lighten up he said after a while. It's been a long day. Amy smiled, but her eyes were still troubled. She reached for his hand and stroked his fingers, masking more serious thoughts with bright banter. I think Pip would consider it quite a coup to have you on the staff full time. She only wants me for an extra afternoon. Two and a half days of your time now. Tomorrow your soul. You were supposed to be encouraging me. Her expression was mischievous. Just letting you know it's useless to resist. Others have tried, she added, her voice deepening ominously, making him grin. Strangely enough, she has been giving me some peculiar looks lately. Working her voodoo? He relaxed back in the chair. A few more people were wandering out into the hotel's beer garden, drinks in hand, taking advantage of a welcome relief from the preceding weeks of cold drizzle. A huge furry bee hovered over nearby azaleas, its drone giving notice of the warmer months to come. Until recently, he had felt close to finding his peace on the island. The easy-going lifestyle, the pleasant nature of the island itself. Amy. Beautiful Amy. His own self-imposed occasional solitude had brought a balance to his existence— a steadiness far removed from the frenetic pace of the constantly changing microchip world, 
a career in and around the madding city, a wife who had once loved him, but who had later been in fear of... of what? Something neither of them understood. Psychic power? An inconsistent curse? Who's serious now? He stared blankly at Amy, her question breaking into his thoughts. You had that far away look, the kind I should be getting used to by now, she said. You weren't just daydreaming. Uh, no, just thinking back. It's in the past, and best kept that way, John. He nodded, unable to explain it to himself, unsure of the creeping uneasiness he had felt since the nightmare two weeks ago. She rested her folded arms on the table. Hey, you haven't given me an answer yet. She frowned at his puzzled expression. My dinner invitation. You haven't said you'll come. Do I have a choice? For a moment the bad thoughts had retreated, vanquished by Amy's wickedly innocent smile. Of course. You can either accept or be deported. Daddy hates bad manners. And we all know his influence in the state's affairs. Precisely. Then I'll come. How sensible. How much coaxing did your mother have to do? Not much. She relied on threats. Hard to imagine your father being afraid of anybody. You don't know mother. She may seem all sweetness and light on the surface, but there's a hidden streak of steel underneath it all that frightens even me sometimes. Hmm. At least it's nice to know she likes me. Oh, I wouldn't go that far. Let's just say she's not totally against you. He laughed quietly. I'm really looking forward to the evening. You know, I think she's quite intrigued by you. A darkly attractive man with a shady past and all that. For a moment, Childs looked down into his beer. Is that how she sees my past? he asked. Well, she thinks you're mysterious and she likes that. And dear Daddy? You're not good enough for his daughter, that's all. You sure? No, but it's not important. He respects my feelings, though, and I haven't disguised how I feel about you. Pig-headed as he is sometimes, he would never hurt me by going against you. Childs wished he could be sure. The financier's hostility on the few occasions they had met was barely masked. Perhaps he didn't like divorces, or perhaps he distrusted anyone who did not conform to his own standards, his perception of normality. In danger of becoming too serious again, Childs asked with a grin, uh, Do I need a dinner suit? Well, one or two of his business associates have been invited, and that includes a member of La Roche's governing body and his wife, incidentally. So nothing too informal. A tie would be nice. And I thought the soiree was for my benefit. Your being there is for my benefit. She looked intently at him. It may seem a trivial thing, but it means a lot to have you with me. I don't know why there's this antagonism between you and my father, John, but it's unnecessary and destructive. And there's no animosity from me, Amy. I know that. And I'm not asking you to bend his way. I just want him to see us together at a normal gathering, to let him see how well we go together. He could not help chuckling, and she gave him a reproving look. I know what you're thinking, and I didn't mean that. I'm still his little girl, remember? He'd never understand how much of a woman you are. He doesn't have to. I'm sure he doesn't imagine I'm still as pure as driven snow, though. I won't be too sure. Such things are hard enough for any doting father to face. The intimacy of their conversation charged his body with a flush of pleasure, and he felt good with her, warm in her presence. It was the same for Amy, for her smile was different not secretive, but knowing, and her pale green eyes were lit with an inner sharing. She looked away and gently whirled the melting ice in her glass, watching the clear, rounded cubes as if they held some meaning. Conversations from other tables drifted in the air, occasionally punctuated by soft laughter. An aircraft banked around the western tip of the island, already over the sea just seconds after takeoff from the tiny airport, its wings catching the reddening sun. A slight evening breeze stirred a lock of hair against Amy's cheek. I should be going, she said after a while. Both were aware of what they really wanted. Child said, 
I'll take you back to La Roche for your car. They finished their drinks and stood together. As they walked through the garden towards the white gates leading to the car park, she slipped her hand into his. He squeezed her fingers, and she returned the pressure. Inside the car, Amy leaned across and kissed his lips, and his desire was tempered and yet inflamed by her tenderness. The sensation for them was as paradoxical as the kiss, both weakening and strengthening at the same time. When they parted, breathless, wanting, his fingertips gently touched a trail along her cheek, brushing her lips and becoming moist from them. He realized that recently their relationship had unexpectedly and bewilderingly reached a new peak. It had been slow in developing, gradual in its emergence, each always slightly wary of the other, he afraid to give too much, she cautious of him as a stranger, unlike any other man she had known. It now seemed that they had just passed a point from which there could only be a lingeringly painful return— and both recognized the inexorable, yet purely sensory truth of it. He turned away, unprepared for this new, plunging shift of emotions, unsure of why, how, it had happened so swiftly. Turning on the ignition and engaging gear, Childs drove into the lane, leading away from the hotel. Childs pushed open the front door of the cottage and briefly stood in the small hallway, collecting his thoughts, catching his breath. He closed the door. Amy's presence was still with him, floating intangibly in the air, and again he wondered at the startling new pace of their feelings for one another. He had held his emotions in check for so long, enjoying her company, taking pleasure in all her aspects, her maturity, her innocence— not least her physical beauty, aware that their relationship was more than friendship, but always in control, unwilling to let go, to succumb to anything deeper. Wounds from his broken marriage were not yet entirely healed, a bitterness still lingered. He could not help but smile wryly. He felt as if he had been zapped by some invisible force. The ringing phone made him start. Childs moved away from the door and picked up the receiver. John. She sounded breathless. Yes, Amy. What happened? He paused before answering. You too. I feel wonderful and terrible at the same time. It's like an exciting ache. He laughed at her description, realizing its aptness. I should say the feeling will pass, but I don't want it to. It's scary, and I love it. He could sense her uncertainty, and her voice was quiet when she added, I don't want to be hurt. Closing his eyes and leaning back against the wall, Child struggled with his own emotions. Well, let's give each other time to think. I don't want to. It might be better for us both. Why? Is there anything more to know about each other? I mean, anything important? We've talked, you've told me about yourself, your past, how you feel. Is there any more that I should know? No, no dark secrets, Amy. You know all that's happened to me. More, much more than anyone else. Then why are you afraid of what's happening to us? I thought you were. Not in that way. I'm only scared of being so vulnerable. Well, that's the answer, don't you see? You think I would do anything to hurt you? Things can happen that we have no control over. I thought they already had. I didn't mean that. Events can somehow interfere, can change feelings. It's happened to me before. You told me your marriage was shaky before those dreadful things happened that they just widen the gulf between you and Fran. Don't run away, John. Not like... She stopped, and Childs finished for her. Not like before. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way. I know circumstances had become intolerable. Amy sighed miserably. Oh, John, why has this conversation turned out like this? I was so happy. I needed to talk to you. I missed you. His tenseness loosened. 
yet a gnawing subconscious disquiet remained. How could he explain his own almost subliminal unrest? Amy, I'm sorry, too. I'm being stupid. I suppose I'm still masochistically licking ancient wounds. Bad past experiences can sometimes distort the new. Very profound. She was relieved the humour was back in his voice, yet could not help but feel a little deflated. I'll try to keep a tighter grip on myself, she said. Hey, come on. Don't mind an old man's self-pity. So, you missed me. I only left you ten minutes ago. I got home from school and felt so... so... I don't know, flushed. Happy, mixed up, sick. I wanted you here. Oh, sounds like a bad case. It is, God help me. I've got it too. But you... I told you. Pay no attention. I get moody sometimes. Don't I know it? Can I buy you lunch tomorrow? Creep. I don't care. The warmth was quickly returning. Uh, tell you what, he said. If you can stand it, I'll cook you lunch here. We'll only have an hour. I'll prepare it tonight. Nothing fancy. Freezer stuff. I love freezer stuff. I love you. He'd finally said the words. John? I'll see you in school, Amy. Her voice was hushed. Yes. He said goodbye and barely heard her response. The line clicked dead. Cradling the receiver, his hand still resting on the smooth plastic, Child stared thoughtfully at the wall. He hadn't meant to let the words slip out, hadn't wanted to breach the final barrier with an admission he knew they both felt. Why did it matter when it was the truth? Just what was he afraid of? It wasn't hard to reason. The bizarre vision, followed by the nightmare a fortnight before, had left him with a dispiriting and familiar apprehension, a rekindling of the dread that had once nearly broken him. It had ruined his life with Fran and Gabby. He didn't want it to hurt Amy. He prayed that he was wrong, that it wasn't happening all over again, that his imagination was running loose. Childs rubbed a hand over his eyes, aware of how sore they had become. Drawing in a deep breath, then releasing the air as if ridding himself of festering notions, he went into the tiny ground-floor bathroom and opened the medicine cabinet. After taking out a small plastic bottle and his lens case, he closed the cabinet door to be confronted by his own image reflected in the mirror. His eyes were bloodshot, and he thought there was an unnatural pallor to his skin. Imagination again, he told himself. He was foolishly allowing the morbid introspection to build, to become something other than it was. Which was a throwback, a long-delayed reaction to something past, and that was all. When he had nearly drowned, it was probably because he had stayed too long beneath the water, not noticing his lungs had used up precious air, lack of oxygen bringing on the confused images. The nightmare later was... was just a nightmare, with no particular significance. He was attributing too much to an unpleasant but unimportant experience, and perhaps it was understandable with past memories to goad his thoughts. Forget it. Things had changed. His life was different. Peering close to the mirror, Childs gently squeezed the soft lens from his right eye, cleansed it in the palm of his hand with the fluid, and dropped it into its liquid-filled container. He repeated the procedure with the left lens. Outside in the hallway, he dipped into his briefcase and withdrew his spectacles, his eyes already feeling relief from the irritation. He was about to go through into the kitchen to discover what he could come up with for lunch the following day, when a soft thud from upstairs stopped him. He held his breath and gazed up the narrow stairway, seeing only as far as the bend. He waited, going through that peculiar middle-of-the-night sensation of not wanting to hear again a mysterious intrusive noise, yet seeking confirmation that one had been heard. There was no further sound. Childs mounted the creaky wooden stairs, unreasonably nervous. 
He rounded the bend and saw that his bedroom door was open. Nothing wrong in that. He had left it open that morning. He always did. Climbing the rest of the stairway, he walked the few feet along the landing and pushed the bedroom door open wider. The room was empty, and he admonished himself for behaving like a timorous maiden aunt. Two windows faced each other across the room, and something small and delicate was clinging to the outside of one. He went over, feeling the bare wooden floorboards giving slightly beneath his weight, and clucked his tongue when he saw the shivering flotsam was no more than a feather stuck to the glass. Either a gull's or a pigeon's, he couldn't be sure which. It had happened before. The bird saw sky in the window on the other side of the room and tried to fly through, striking the window pane on that side, but rarely doing more damage than giving themselves a shock and probably a severe headache, leaving a plume or two on the glass. Even as he watched, the breeze caught the feather and whisked it away. Childs was about to turn around when he caught sight of the distant school. His heart stopped momentarily, and his hands gripped the sill when he saw the fiery glow. His relief was instant when he quickly realized the white building was merely reflecting the setting sun's rubescent rays. But the image remained in his mind, and when he sat down on the bed, his hands were trembling. It watched from beneath a tree the cheerfully sunny day giving the lie to the misery witnessed in the cemetery. The mourners were grouped around the open grave, dark clothes struck grey by the sunlight. Stained white crosses, slabs, and smiling cracked angels were dispassionate observers in the field of sunken bones. The mushy cadence of traffic could be heard in the distance, somewhere a radio was snapped off the graveyard worker realising a ceremony was in progress. The priest's voice carried as a muffled intonation to the low knoll where the figure waited in the yew's shadow. When the tiny coffin was lowered, a woman staggered forward as if to forbid the final violation of her dead child. A man at her side held the woman firm, supporting her weight as she sagged. Others in the group bowed their heads or looked away, the mother's agony as unbearable as the untimely death itself. Hands were raised to faces, tissues dampened against cheeks, the features of the men were frozen, pale plastic moulds. It watched from the hiding place and smiled secretly. The little casket disappeared from view, swallowed by the dank soil, green-edged lips eagerly wide. The father threw something in after the coffin, a bright-coloured object, a toy, a doll, something that had once been precious to the child, before earth was scattered into the grave. Reluctantly, yet with private relief, the bereaved group began to drift away. The mother had to be gently led, supported between two others, her head constantly turning as if the dead infant were calling her back, pleading with her not to leave it there, lonely and cold and corrupting. The grief overwhelmed, and the mother had to be half carried to the waiting funeral cars. The figure beneath the tree stayed while the grave was filled, to return again later that night. Thank you, Helen. I think you can clear away now. Vivian Sabir noted with manifest satisfaction that the meal she had so carefully and lovingly prepared earlier that afternoon, salmon mousse, followed by apple and cherry duckling, served with mange tout and broccoli, had been devoured with relish and much voiced praise. She observed, however, that Jonathan Childs had not eaten as heartily as the rest of their guests. Grace Duxbury, sitting close to the host, Paul Sibir, who was at the head of the table, trilled, Marvellous, Vivian. Now, I want to know the secret of that moose before I leave this house tonight. Oh, yes, agreed her husband. Excellent first course. Why is it, Grace, that yours rarely venture beyond avocado with prawns unless we've got the caterers in? A remark that would be paid for later, 
if she knew Grace, thought Vivian, smiling at them both. Ah, the secret's in just how much anchovy essence you add. A little more than is recommended, but not too much. Oh, delicious, reaffirmed George Duxbury. Helen, a short, stoutish woman with a cheerful smile and eyebrows that tended to converge to a point above her nose, and who was the Sabir's housekeeper come maid, began collecting dishes while her mistress preened herself on more praise. Amy, sitting opposite and slightly to the right of Childs, rose from her seat. Now I'll give you a hand, she said to Helen, making eye contact with Childs, a covert smile passing between them. "'What I'd like to know, Paul, is how a reprobate like you "'manages to have a beautiful and brilliant cook for a wife "'and an absolute charmer for a daughter.' "'The good-humoured jibe was delivered by Victor Platnauer, "'a concierge of the island and a member of La Roche Ladies' College's governing board. "'His wife Tilly, seated next to Childs, tutted reproachfully, "'although allowing herself to join in the chuckles of her fellow guests. Uh, "'Quite simple, Victor.' Sabir reposted in his usual crisp manner. "'It was my darling wife's culinary expertise that coaxed me to marry her, "'and my genes that produced our beautiful Amy.' "'He always insisted on calling his daughter by her correct name. "'No, no,' Platnauer insisted. "'Amy inherits her looks from her mother, not her father. "'Isn't that correct, Mr. Childs, uh, Jonathan?' "'She has both her parents' finer points.' Childs managed to say it diplomatically, dabbing his lips with a napkin. Score one, thought Amy, halfway through the door to the kitchen, as someone clapped and proclaimed, oh, Bravo! <sighs> so far, so good. She had observed her father discreetly studying John throughout the evening, knowing so well that calculating appraisal usually reserved for prospective clients, colleagues, or rivals. Nevertheless, he had played the perfect host, courteous and suitably inquisitive of his guest, allowing John as much attention as any of the others, including a business associate from Marseille. Amy suspected that Edouard Vigier had been invited not just because he happened to be on the island that week to discuss certain financial arrangements, but because he was young, successful, yet still thrusting, and very eligible. An ideal son-in-law in Paul Sabir's eyes. She was beginning to wonder if her father's sole motive in inviting John was so that she, Amy, would be presented with a direct comparison between the two, Edouard and John, the contrast undeniable. She had to admit that the Frenchman was attractive as well as bright and amusing, but her father was wrong, as usual, in judging by such obvious and superficial standards. She knew Paul Sibir to be a kind man with a generous heart, despite his cutting ruthlessness in business affairs and thorniness over certain matters, and she loved him as much as any daughter could love a father. Unfortunately, his self-concealed possessiveness dictated that if he were to surrender his daughter to another, then it would be someone in his own image, of his own kind, if not a younger version of himself. It was a transparently clumsy ploy, although her father probably deemed it subtle, as usual underestimating others, particularly his only child. Amy thought dreamily of her lunch with John earlier that week, their first confrontation alone in his cottage, after having realised just how far their relationship had journeyed, how much more deeply they cared for each other than either had understood before. There had been little time for intimacies that day, but touching, holding, caressing had been filled with a new potency, a new tenderness. I like those plates, Miss Amy, when you finish listening at the door. Helen's amused voice had broken into the reverie. She stood one hand on the sink, the other clenched on her hip. Oh. Amy smiled sheepishly. She carried the dishes over to the draining board. I wasn't eavesdropping, Helen. Only daydreaming. Just lost somewhere. Victor Platnauer was leaning forward over the table, looking directly at Childs. In his early sixties, Platnauer was still a well-proportioned man, with a hard ruddiness to his features and large hands that was common to many of the native islanders. There was a gravelly tone to his voice, a bluffness in his manner. 
By contrast, his wife Tilly was soft-spoken, almost demure, similar in appearance and demeanour to Vivienne Sabir. "'I'm pleased to hear you're to give La Roche a little more of your time,' Platnower said. Well, "'Only an extra afternoon,' Charles replied. "'I agreed earlier this week.' Oh, yes, so Miss Piprelli informed me. Well, that's good news, but perhaps we can persuade you to spend even more time at the college. I'm aware that you also teach at Kingsley and de Montfort, but it's important to us that we extend this particular area of our curriculum. It isn't only a parental demand. I'm told the pupils have shown great keenness for computer sciences. Well, that's not true of all of them, unfortunately, said Childs. But the children, I mean. I think we're fooling ourselves if we imagine every kid has a special aptitude for electronic calculation and compilation. Tilly Platnower looked surprised. I thought we were well into the Star Wars era, with every boy and girl a microchip genius compared to their elders. Child smiled. Oh, we're just at the beginning, and electronic games are not quite the same as the practical application of computers, although I'll admit they're a start. You see... The computer process is totally logical, but not every child has total logic. Neither do many of us grown-ups, Victor Platnower commented dryly. It's a double-edged sword, in a way, Charles went on. The leisure industry has encouraged the consumer to think that computers are fun, and that's OK, it creates interest. It's when the public, or the kids in our case, discover hard work is involved before enjoyment through understanding begins that the big turn-off comes. Surely, then, the answer is to begin the teaching at the earliest age, so it would become an everyday part of the child's life. It was Edouard Vigier who had spoken, his accent softening rather than distorting his words. Oh, yep, you're right. But you're talking of an ideal situation where the computer is a normal household item, a regular piece of furniture like the TV or stereo unit. We're a long way off from that situation. All the more reason for schools to introduce our children to the technology while their minds are still young and pliable, wouldn't you say? asked Platnower. Oh, ideally, yes, agreed Childs. But you have to understand, it isn't a science that's within everybody's grasp. The unfortunate side is that microtechnology will become a way of life within the next couple of decades, and a hell of a lot of companies and individuals are going to feel left behind. "'Then we must ensure that the children of this island don't fall by the wayside,' stated Paul Sabir to Platnower's nodded approval. Childs hid his exasperation that his point had been missed, or at least gone unheeded. Technical knowledge could be spoon or force-fed, but it was not so easily digested if the inclination was not there. Vigier changed the conversation's direction. Do you also teach science at La Roche and these other schools, Jean? Sabir unexpectedly answered for him. Not at all. Mr. Childs is a computer specialist, Edouard. Something of a technical wizard, I gather. Childs looked sharply at Sabir and wondered how he had gathered. Amy? Ah, said Vigier. Then I am curious to know what made you turn to the teaching of children. Isn't this a, uh, let me see, a, a slowdown? Is that correct? Uh, yeah. I am sorry if my question appears impertinent, but uh, an abrupt change of lifestyle, um, brusque changement de vie, we would say, is always interesting. Do you not agree? He smiled charmingly, and Childs was suddenly wary. "'Sometimes you discover running on a constant treadmill isn't all it's cracked up to be,' he replied. Vivian Sabir enjoyed the response, and added, "'Well, who could resist the peacefulness of the island, despite how much you money men try to disrupt it?' She looked meaningfully at her husband. The door leading to the kitchen opened, and Amy and Helen came through, carrying the dessert on silver trays. Uh, "'More delights!' enthused George Duxbury. "'What are you tempting us with now, Vivian?' "'There's a choice,' she told them as the sweets were placed in the centre of the table. "'The apricot and chocolate dessert is mine, "'and the raspberry souffle omelette is a speciality of Amy's. "'You can, of course, have both if you've room.' "'Well, I'll make room,' Duxbury assured her. "'My nutritionist would throw a fit if she could see me now.' His wife was already offering up her plate to the amusement of all. 
Yeah, apricots and chocolate, please, but uh, don't ask me if I want cream. Amy sat while Helen served. Vigier, seated next to her, leaned close and spoke confidentially. I shall most certainly try the souffle. It looks delicious. She smiled to herself. Edouard had the kind of low voice that could sell liqueurs on television. Oh, mother is a far superior chef. I only dabble, I'm afraid. I am sure that whatever you do, it is well. Your father tells me you also teach at La Roche. Yes, French and English. I also help out with speech and drama. Oh, so you are fluent in my language? Your name implies that you are of French descent, yes? And if I may be permitted to say, you have a certain ambiance that has an affinity with the women of my country. Your own Victor Hugo once wrote that these islands were fragments of France picked up by England. And as we were once part of the Duchy of Normandy, many of us have French forebears. The patois is still spoken by a few of our older residents here, and I'm sure you've noticed we retain many of the ancient place names. Grace Duxbury had overheard their conversation. We've always been a prized possession, Monsieur Vigier, for more than one nation. I hope you, my country has never caused you distress, he responded, humour in his eyes. Distress? laughed Paul Sabir. You have tried to invade us more than once, and your pirates never left us alone in the old days. Even Napoleon had a crack at us in later times, but I'm afraid he got a bloody nose. Vigier sipped his wine, obviously amused. We've always appreciated our French origins, though, Sabir continued, and I'm pleased to say our associations have never been relinquished. I gather you do not have the same warm feelings towards the Germans. Huh. Different thing entirely. Platnow voiced gruffly. Their wartime occupation is recent history, and with their pillboxes and damned coastal fortresses all over the place, it's hard to forget. Having said that, there's no real animosity between us now. In fact, many veterans of the occupying forces return as tourists nowadays. It's rather strange how attractive this island has been to man from far, far back, said Sabir, indicating his preference for the souffle, too. In Neolithic times, he made his way here to bury his dead and worship the gods. Massive granite tombs still survive, and the land is practically littered with megaliths and menias, those standing stones they paid homage to. Rémy, why don't you show Edouard around the island tomorrow? He returns to Marseille on Monday and hasn't had a chance to take a really good look at the place since he's been here. What do you think, Edouard? I should like that very much, replied the Frenchman. Well, unfortunately, John and I have made plans for tomorrow. Amy smiled, but there was a coolness in the look she flashed her father. Nonsense, Sabir persisted, conscious of her annoyance, but undeterred. You see each other all the time at the college, and most evenings, it seems, nowadays. I'm sure Jonathan wouldn't mind releasing you for a few hours, considering how little time our guest has left. He looked amiably along the table at Childs, who had been engaged in conversation with Vivian Sabir, but whose attention had been drawn at the mention of his name. I, um, I guess it's up to Amy, he said uncertainly. Oh, there you are, Sabir said, smiling at his daughter. No problem. Embarrassed, Vigier started to say, oh, It really does not matter if... No, that's quite all right, Edouard, Sabir cut in. Amy is well used to helping entertain my business visitors. I often wish she had chosen my profession rather than teaching. She would have been a remarkable asset to the company. I'm sure of that. You know I have no interest in corporate finance, said Amy, disguising her chagrin at having little choice but to accept her imposed role as tourist guide. John, why don't you help me? I enjoy children. I enjoy doing something useful. I'm not criticising, but your way of making money wouldn't be fulfilling enough for me. I need to see some tangible evidence of success for my efforts not just figures on balance sheets. And do you find this with your students? asked Vigier. Why, yes, with many. I'm sure with most, with you as their tutor, Sabir put forward. Daddy, you're being patronising, she warned menacingly. The two men laughed together, and Grace Duxbury said, Pay them no mind, Amy, dear. They're both obviously of that near-extinct breed who imagine that men still rule the world. 
Tell me, Monsieur Vigier, have you tried many of our restaurants during your stay? Tell me how you found them compared to some of the excellent cuisines of your own country. While the conversation went on, Amy glanced over at Childs. She tried to convey apology for the next day in her expression, and he understood, shaking his head imperceptibly. He raised his wine glass, tilting it slightly in her direction before drinking. Lifting her own glass, Amy returned the toast. Helen had returned to the kitchen and was already loading the dishwasher with plates and cutlery from the sink. She was pleased for her mistress that the dinner party appeared to be going so well. Miss Amy was lucky to have two men in attendance, and Helen wondered how she could resist the smooth, cultured Frenchman with his French ways and his French looks and his French voice. Irresistible. She shivered and reached over the work surface near the sink to close the window. The night had turned chilly, and it was black out there, the moon but a thin sliver. Helen pulled the window shut. There was laughter around the dining table as Duxbury, who, as well as being a commodity importer to the island, supplying local companies with office furniture, equipment, and generally whatever else they needed, also arranged sales conferences for outside organisations, regaled his fellow guests with one of his long-winded but generally funny conference mishap stories. Childs took a spoonful of the souffle and made an appreciative face at Amy. She mouthed a discreet kiss in return. He had felt on edge at the beginning of the evening, unsure of Paul Sabir, aware that he would be put through some devious kind of test by him, a judgment of character and perhaps of his worth, now that it was evident Amy was becoming seriously involved. Yet the financier had been more than cordial throughout, the curtness of previous meetings gone, or at least held in check. Still, Childs had not relaxed, gradually becoming aware that the younger Frenchman was not just another dinner guest, but introduced by Sabir as a potential rival. The Sabir inspired outing for Amy and Vigier the following day had confirmed his suspicions. It was both obvious and disingenuous, but Childs had to admit he did look a little shabby against Vigier. On the other hand, Vivian Sabir had been gracious and attentive, genuinely welcoming him, and, like the perfect hostess, making him feel a valued guest. She was the ideal counter to her husband's general brusqueness. He joined in the laughter as Duxbury reached the climax of his story, the importer barely giving them all time to recover before launching into another. Childs reached for his wine, and as he brought it towards him, he thought he caught a glimmering in the glass. He blinked, then peered into the light liquid. He had been mistaken. It must have been a reflection. Childs sipped, and was about to place the wine glass back on the table when something seemed to stir within it. He looked again, bemused rather than concerned. No, just wine inside. Nothing else. Nothing that... An image but not in the glass in his mind. Suppressed chuckling as Duxbury continued his yarn. The image was unreal, unfocused, like the nightmare, a shimmering blur. Childs set the wine glass down, aware that his hand was shaking. A peculiar sensation had gripped the back of his neck, like a hand, a frigid hand, clasped there. He stared into the liquid. Amy giggled, suspecting Duxbury's story was building to a somewhat risque ending. The image had become images. They were slowly swimming into focus. The warmth of the room had become suffocating. Childs's other hand unconsciously went to his shirt collar as if to loosen it. Grace Duxbury, having heard her husband's story on numerous other occasions in different company and knowing the punchline, was already twittering with embarrassment. Childs's vision had shifted inwards. He viewed a scenario inside his mind, an event that was beyond the confines of the room, yet within himself. He seemed to be moving closer to the ethereal activity, becoming integrated with it, a participant, but still he was only watching. 
soft earth was being disturbed. Victor Platnauer's rasping chuckle, a low rumble about to erupt, was infectious, and Vivian Sabir found herself laughing even before the story was concluded. Blunt, stubby fingers covered in damp soil, scraping against wood, the effort renewed, frantic, the wood cleared of earth so that its shape was revealed, narrow, rectangular, small. Child shuddered, spilling wine. Vigier had noticed, was staring across the table at Childs. The coffin lid was smashed, splinters bursting outwards under the axe blows. Jagged segments were ripped away, the hole enlarged. The tiny body was exposed, its features unclear in the dismal light. Childs's hand tightened on the glass. The room was shifting. He could barely breathe. The invisible pressure on the nape of his neck increased, squeezing like a vice. For a moment, the hands, seen by Childs, almost as his own, paused, as if the defiler had sensed something, had become aware of being observed, sensed Childs himself. Something deep inside his mind was coldly touched. The moment passed. Tilly Platnauer knew she should not be enjoying the tale, but Duxbury's bluff rendition was compelling. Her shoulders were already beginning to judder with mirth. The little corpse was torn free from the silk-lined casket, and now Childs could see the tiny, open eyes that had no depth, no life force. The boy was laid on the grass beside the pit, where the night breeze ruffled his hair, blowing wisps across his pale, unlined forehead, giving an illusion of vitality. His clothes were cut free and pulled aside so that the body was naked to the night, white marble in colour and stillness. Metal glinted in the thin moonlight, plunging downward, entering, slicing. The glass shattered, wine mixed with blood spilling on the lace tablecloth. Someone screamed. Childs had risen, knocking over his chair, was standing over them, swaying, his eyes staring towards the ceiling, a glistening wetness to his lips, a light sheen moistening his skin. His body shook, went rigid, even his hair appeared brittle. With a desolate cry, he fell forward onto the table. Gloatingly, it bit into the heart of the dead child. Amy clenched her fists and closed her eyes against the reflection of her father. They were in her bedroom, she white-faced, with eyes tear-puffed and red, sitting miserably at her dressing table. Paul Sabir agitated, angrily pacing the room behind her. She could not clear her mind from the sight of John when he had been led away from the house by Platnauer, the concierge, helping him into his own car, refusing to allow him to drive himself home, despite his protests. John's face had been so taut, so stricken. He had refused a doctor, had insisted that he was okay, that he had just suffered a blackout, that the heat of the dining room had overcome him. They knew that the night was cool that the house was merely warm, not too hot, but hadn't argued. He would be fine as soon as he could lie down, he had told them, as soon as he could rest. He strenuously declined Amy and Vivian's offer of a bed for the night, saying he just needed to be on his own for a while. His distant gaze had frightened her as much as his ashen face, but it was useless to argue. She had held him before he left, feeling his inner trembling, wishing she could soothe it away. His cut hand had been treated and bandaged, and Amy had brought it to her lips before letting him go, kissing the fingertips, careful not to hold on too tightly. Childs hadn't allowed her to go with him. Paul Sabir stopped pacing. Amy, he said, putting a hand on her shoulder, I don't want you to be angry. I just want you to listen to me and to be rational. He stroked her hair, then let his hand fall back onto her shoulder. I'd like you to end this relationship with Childs. He waited for the outburst, which never came. Amy was merely staring coldly at his reflection in the mirror, and in a way that was more unsettling. He went on, 
his tone cautious. "'I believe the man is unstable. At first I thought tonight he was suffering from an epileptic fit of some kind, but soon realized the symptoms were not the same. Amy, I think the man is heading for a mental breakdown.' "'He's not unstable,' Amy said calmly. "'He's not neurotic, and he's not heading for a breakdown. "'You don't know him, Daddy. "'You don't know what he's been through.' Oh, but I do, Amy. I just wonder if you're fully aware of his background. What do you mean? She had turned towards Sabir, his hand sliding from her shoulder with the movement. Something rang a bell for me a long time ago when you first started mentioning his name. I couldn't put my finger on it, although I was bothered for quite some time. More recently, when I began to suspect you were becoming seriously involved with him, I did some checking. He raised a defensive hand. Now, don't look at me like that, Amy. You're my only daughter, and I care more about you than anything in the world. So do you really think I wouldn't pursue a troublesome matter which concerned you? Wouldn't it have been possible to ask me about John? Ask you what? I had a feeling, that was all. A nagging doubt. Yet I couldn't be sure of how much you yourself knew about Childs. And what did you discover? She asked caustically. "'Well, I knew roughly when he had come over from the mainland "'and that he had a career in the computer industry before. "'I asked Victor Pladnauer, as a member of the Island Police Committee, "'to make a discreet, I, I promise you it was discreet, "'investigation into Charles's background, "'whether he had had any dealings with the police in the past, that sort of thing. "'Do you imagine he would have been employed by any of the colleges "'if he had some kind of criminal record?' Well, "'Of course not. I was looking for something else.' I told you his name was somehow familiar to me, and I didn't know why. So you found out what drove him away from England, why he was forced to leave his family? Well, you made no secret of his divorce, so that didn't come as a surprise. But what did was the fact that he had been under suspicion for murder. Daddy, if you had him thoroughly investigated, you must be aware of all the facts. John helped solve those crimes— the penalty he paid was false accusations and relentless hounding by the media, even for long afterwards. Officially, the murders were never solved. She groaned aloud, half in despair, half in anger. Sabir was undaunted. There was a series of three murders, and the evidence indicated the killer was the same person. All the victims were children. And John was able to give the police vital clues. He led them to where the last two were buried, that's true enough. But everyone wanted to know how, Amy. That's what caused the outcry. He told them. He explained. He said he witnessed the killings. Not physically. He hadn't actually been there when the crimes had been committed. But he had seen them happen. Can you blame the police, the public, for wondering? He has had a, a kind of second sight. It's not unusual, Daddy. It's happened to others. Police have often used psychics to help them solve crimes. Whenever a particularly gruesome series of murders is reported, any number of crackpots always contact the police saying the spirits have told them what the murderer looks like or where he'll strike next. It's common and pathetic and a total waste of police time. Not always. It isn't always. Crimes have been solved by such people many times in the past. And you're telling me Childs is one of these... "'Gifted persons?' Sabir made the word gifted sound like a sneer. "'That's what the newspapers reported at the time.' "'That's just the point. He isn't. He's not clairvoyant. He's not psychic in the usual sense. John had never experienced such an insight before, not in that way. He was just as mystified and confused as anyone else, and frightened. "'The police held him on suspicion.' They were staggered by what he knew. Of course they suspected him at first, but he had too many witnesses testifying he was elsewhere at the time of the murders. We still felt he was involved in some way. He was too accurate with his information. They eventually traced the murderer and proved that John had no connection with him. I'm sorry, but that's not on record. The killings were never solved. Check with your sources, Daddy. You'll find that they were. Unofficially. The madman cut his own throat. 
The case was never officially closed because he left no suicide note, nothing to admit he had murdered the children. All the authorities had was very strong circumstantial, no conclusive evidence against him. They hinted as much at the time, and so did the newspapers, but no one could officially announce the fact. The law itself prevented them from doing so. But the murderer killed himself because he knew they were closing in. John had given the police enough information for them to pinpoint their man, someone who was known to them as a child molester, who had spent time in prison because of it. The killing stopped when he took his own life. Then why did Childs run away? Sabir was pacing the room again, determined not to leave until he had made his daughter see sense. He deserted his wife and child to come here. What could make him do such a thing? He didn't desert them. Not in the way you're suggesting. Amy's voice had risen. He didn't desert them. Not in the way you're suggesting. Amy's voice had risen in pitch. John begged his wife to come with him, but she refused. The pressure had been too much for her as well. She didn't want either herself or Gabrielle, their daughter, to be subjected to any more innuendo, phone calls from cranks, the media at first pointing the finger of suspicion, and later trying to build John into some kind of super-freak. She knew there'd be no peace for them. Well, even so, to leave... Their marriage was in trouble before that. John's wife was a career woman when they were first married. When their daughter came along, she took up all her time. Fran became sick of being a housewife, always living in his shadow. She wanted her own life before these incidents took place. And the child? How could... Amy's voice lowered. He loves Gabrielle. It nearly broke him to leave her. But he knew if he stayed, the tension would destroy them all. There was nothing he could offer his daughter on his own. He didn't know at that stage how he would live, what he would do. My God, he'd thrown away a brilliant career, was leaving his wife everything they possessed and almost all their savings. How could he take care of a four-year-old daughter? Why here, of all places? Why did he come to this island? Sabir had once more stopped his pacing, was now hovering over Amy, his own anger building. Because it's close to home, don't you see? It's far enough away for him to have been a stranger when he arrived, yet easy for him to return, to keep in touch with his family. John hasn't walked out. He hasn't turned his back on them. He was devastated when he discovered his wife had sued for divorce. Perhaps he imagined one day they'd patch things up for the sake of Gabrielle, that they'd come to live with him here, I don't know. He may even have had plans for returning to England in a few years' time, when he would be long forgotten by the public. All that changed when he received the divorce papers. OK, Amy. Given all that, accepting there was no complicity on his part in those brutal killings, and that he was not totally to blame for the break-up of his marriage... Amy opened her mouth to speak, her pale eyes blazing, but Sabir stopped her. Hear me out. His manner was firm, allowing no dissension. The fact remains that the man is not normal. How do you explain these... I don't know what you call them. I'm not familiar with psychic mumbo-jumbo. Let's just say intuitions. Why on earth did they happen to him? Nobody knows. Least of all John himself. No one can explain them. Why are you blaming him? I'm not blaming him for anything. I'm merely pointing out that there's something odd about the man. Can you tell me exactly what happened here tonight? What caused his so-called blackout? Has this sort of thing ever occurred before? Good God, Amy. What have you been driving a car? Perhaps with you in it? I don't know what happened to him, and neither does he. And as far as I know, he's never suffered anything similar. But he refuses to even consult a doctor. He will. I'll make him. You will stay away from him. Amy smiled disbelievingly. Do you really think I'm still a child to be told what I can and cannot do? Do you honestly imagine you can forbid me to see him again? She laughed, but the sound was brittle without humour. Wake up to the twentieth century, Daddy. I shouldn't think Victor Platnauer is too keen on having a tutor in his school who is susceptible to fainting spells. Her breath escaped her. Are you serious? Absolutely. She shook her head and stared at him with a simmering anger. He wasn't well. It could have happened to anybody. 
Perhaps. With anyone else, it would soon be forgotten, though. And you won't forget this? That's hardly the point. Tell me what is. He worries me. I'm afraid for you. He's a kind, gentle man. I don't want you involved with him. I already am. Very. Sabir visibly flinched. He strode to the door and stopped, looking back at her. She knew her father so well, knew his ruthlessness when opposed. His words were controlled, but there was seething intensity in his eyes. I think it's time others were made aware of Childs's dubious past, he said, before leaving the room and firmly closing the door behind him. Perspiration flowed from him, literally trickling in smooth rivulets onto the sheets of the bed. He turned onto his side, damp bedclothes clinging, his own dank smell unpleasant. The vision, the sighting, was still fresh in Childs's mind, for it had been so real, its horror so tangible, so palpable. It filled him now, potent, vigorous. His presence had been in the graveyard, so close to the little corpse, almost feeling its cold, clammy touch. For a few brief moments he had existed inside the other being, this thing that had defiled the dead child, had felt its obscene glory, yet had been apart from it, an observer with no influence, a watcher of no power. Still the thoughts persisted and with them, sneaking through like an insidious informant, came a new dread, an unspeakable notion that caused him to moan aloud. The thought was too distressing to contemplate, yet would not go away. Surely he would have known, would have been aware in some way, no matter how deeply hidden his conscious mind had kept the secret. But hadn't he felt at one stage when those monstrous hands had raised the lifeless body from the grave, that they were his own, that those hands belonged to him. Was the vision merely a released memory? Was he himself the desecrator? No, that couldn't be. It couldn't be. Child stared at the closed window, and listened to the night. It sat in the shadows, watching the slender crescent of light that was the moon through the grimy window, and it grinned, thoughts dwelling on the ceremony it had carried out in the burial ground earlier that night. It relived the exquisite moment of opening the body, of scattering the contents, and relished the memory. A tongue slid across parted lips. The silent heart had tasted good. But now a frown changed its countenance. In the cemetery, for one brief moment as it had drawn out the dead child, a sensation had stayed the movement, a feeling of being watched. The graveyard had been deserted, though, that was certain. Only headstones and frozen angels, the nocturnal spectators, Yet there had been contact with something, with someone, a touching of spirits. Who? And how was it possible? The figure stirred in the chair as a cloud engulfed the moon. Its breathing was shallow and harsh until the feeble light returned. It considered the possibility that someone was aware of its existence, and stretched its mind, seeking the interloper, Searching, but not finding. Not yet. But in time. In time. You look a little pale, Estelle Piprelli remarked as Childs entered the study and took a chair facing her on the other side of the broad desk. I'm fine, he responded. You've hurt yourself. He raised the bandaged hand in a deprecative gesture. I broke a glass. Nothing serious, just a few minor cuts. The ceiling was high, the walls half-panelled in light oak, the upper portions a restful pastel green, except one wall which was covered from floor to ceiling with crowded bookshelves. 
A portrait of La Roche's founder dominated the wall to Child's right, undoubtedly an accurate facsimile, but one that revealed little of the sitter's true character, so typical of many Victorian studies. Beside the door, an ancient clock loudly ticked away the seconds, as if each one was an announcement in itself. Childs looked past La Roche's principal, bright sunlight from the huge windows behind her, blazing her grey hair silver. Outside were the school gardens, green lawns bordered with awakening flowers and shrubs, the slanted roof of a white-framed summer-house dazzlingly mirroring the sun's rays. Beyond were the cliff-tops, rugged and decaying, slowly eroding bastions against the sea. The darker blue of the horizon indicated the clear divide between sea and sky, a distinct edge to the calm affinity between both elements. Although the room itself was spacious and its tone soothing, Child suddenly felt confined, as if the walls were restraining an energy emanating from within himself, a force that the bounds of his own physical body could not contain. He knew that the sensation was simple claustrophobia, nothing more, and much of it was due to the impending confrontation with the headmistress. "'I had a call from Victor Platnow this morning,' Miss Piprelli began, confirming his expectation. "'I believe you met on a social basis last Saturday evening?' Childs nodded. "'He told me of your uh, unfortunate accident,' the principal went on. "'He said that you had fainted during dinner.' "'No, uh, dinner was just about over.' "'She eyed him coolly. "'He was concerned over your state of health. "'There is, after all, a huge responsibility on your shoulders when teaching youngsters, "'and such an occurrence in the classroom could cause some distress among the girls. "'As one of our governors, Concier Platnau, "'was seeking some assurance that you were not prone to such collapses.' "'I think that's reasonable, don't you?' "'It's the first time ever for me. Really. "'Any idea as to why it happened? Have you consulted a doctor yet?' "'He hesitated before answering. Uh, "'No, to both questions. I'm okay now. I don't need a doctor.' "'Nonsense. If you fainted, there must be a reason for it. Well, "'Maybe I was a little tensed up on Saturday. A personal thing. "'Enough to make you black out?' she scoffed mildly. "'I can only tell you it's not a regular occurrence with me. "'I feel healthy nowadays, probably healthier than I've felt in a long time. "'Life on the island has meant a big change for me, a different style of living, "'away from the pressure of my last job, out of a rat-race profession. "'And I don't mind admitting there was a considerable strain on my marriage for several years. "'Things have changed since I came here. "'I'm more relaxed. I'd even say more content.' "'Yes, I can believe that. "'But as I said when you came in, you look a trifle peaky.' "'What happened shook me, as well as the other dinner guests,' he said testily. "'He felt uncomfortable under her gaze and looked away, "'brushing an imaginary speck of dust from his cords. "'For a moment it had seemed she had looked into the very core of him. "'All right, Mr. Childs. "'I don't intend to pursue that particular matter any further. "'However, I do suggest you consult a doctor at the earliest opportunity. "'Your fainting spell may well be a symptom of some hidden illness.' "'He was relieved, but said nothing. "'Miss Piprelli likely tapped the blunt end of a fountain pen on the desktop, "'as if it were a gavel. "'Victor Platnauer also brought something else to my attention.' "'Something, I'm afraid, to do with your past history, Mr. Childs, "'and of which you have omitted to inform me.' "'He straightened in his seat, body tensed, hands clasping his knees, knowing what was coming. "'I refer, of course, to the unhappy dealings you had with the police before you came to the island.' "'He should have realised it would not be forgotten so easily, "'that England was too close, too accessible for such news not to have travelled.' and to have been remembered by some. Had Platnauer always known? No. It would have been mentioned long before. Someone had told him very recently, and Child smiled to himself, for it was so obvious. Paul Sabir had looked into his background. Either that or Amy had told her father, and passed on the interesting information to the school governor. In a funny way, he was glad the secret was out, 
even though he considered it to be nobody's business but his own. Suppression leads to depression, right? he told himself. Right, he answered. I beg your pardon? The headmistress looked surprised. My dealings with the police, as you put it, were purely as a source of information. I helped, in the true sense, with their investigations. So I gather. Although your method was rather peculiar, wouldn't you say that? Yes, I would say that. In fact, the idea still astounds me. As to my not having informed you when you hired me, I hardly thought it necessary. I wasn't criminally involved. Quite so, and I'm not making an issue of it now. It was Childs's turn to be surprised. My, um, standing here isn't affected in any way? The ticking clock timed the pause. Six seconds. I think it only fair that I tell you I've asked our police department to supply me with more information on the matter. You should appreciate my reasons for doing so. You're not going to fire me? She didn't smile, and her manner had its usual brusqueness, but he regarded her with new interest when she said, I see no reason for doing so, not at this stage at any rate. Unless you have anything further to tell me right now, anything that I'll probably find out anyway? He shook his head. I've got nothing to hide, Miss Piprelli, I promise you that. Very well. We have a particular need for your special abilities. Otherwise, I wouldn't have asked you to spare La Roche more of your time. And that I've explained to Victor Platnard. I must admit, he was reluctant to see my point of view at first. But he's a fair-minded man. He will, however, be keeping a close eye on you, Mr. Childs, as I shall. We've agreed to keep the whole affair strictly to ourselves. La Roche would find any such publicity regarding yourself... "'Totally unacceptable. "'We have a long-established reputation to protect.' "'Estelle Piprelli sat back in her chair, "'and even though her body was still ramrod straight, "'the position seemed almost relaxed for her. "'She continued to study Childs "'with that unsettling, penetrating gaze, "'and the fountain pen stood stiffly between her fingers, "'base resting on the desktop like a tiny, immovable post. "'He wondered about her. "'wondered about her sudden frown, what she was reading in his expression. "'Was there just a hint of alarm behind the thick lenses of her spectacles? "'She quickly recovered, leaving him unsure that he had seen any change at all in her demeanour. "'I won't keep you any longer,' Miss Piprelli said curtly. "'I'm sure we both have lots to do.' "'I want him out of the room,' she thought. "'I want him out now.' "'It wasn't his fault.' He wasn't to blame for this outrageous extra sense he possessed, just as she was not responsible for her own strange faculty. She could not get rid of the man on that basis. It would have been too hypocritical, too cruel. But she wanted his presence away from her, now, that instant. For a moment she had thought he'd seen through her own rigid mask— had sensed the ability in her, an unwelcome gift that was as unacceptable to her as adverse publicity was unacceptable to the school. Her secret, her affliction, was not to be shared. It had been too closely guarded for too many years. She would take the chance of keeping him on. He was owed that much. But she would keep away from him, avoid unnecessary contact. Miss Piprelli would not give Childs the opportunity to recognise their similarity. That would be too foolhardy, too much to give after so long. Dangerous even for someone in her position. I'm sorry, Mr. Childs, is there something you wanted to say? She deliberately quelled her impatience, years of self-discipline coming to her aid. Only thanks. I appreciate your trust. That has nothing whatsoever to do with it. If I thought you untrustworthy, I wouldn't have employed you in the first place. Let's just say I value your expertise. He rose, managed to smile. Estelle Piprelli was an enigma to him. He started to say something, then thought better of it. He left the room. The principal closed her eyes and let her head rest against the high-backed chair. The sun on her shoulders unable to dispense the chill. Outside in the corridor, Childs began to shake. 
Earlier that morning he had assumed he was in control, that much of the anguish had been purged the day before, literally walked from his system, so exhausting him that when he returned home sleep would overwhelm him. And it had. There had been no dreams, no restless turning in the bed, no sweat-soaked sheets, just several hours of oblivion. That morning he had awoken feeling refreshed, the sighted images of Saturday evening a contained memory, still disturbing but at least uneasily settled in a compartment of his mind. Subconscious reflex, self-protecting mental conditioning. There had to be a legitimate medical term with which to label the reaction. The morning newspaper had easily shattered that temporary defence. Still, he had gone through the motions of everyday living, unnerved but determined to get through the day. Halfway there, and then his meeting with Miss Piprelli. Now he was shaking. John? He turned, startled, and Amy saw his fear. She hurried to him. John, what's wrong? You look awful. Childs clung to her briefly. Let's get out of here, he said. Can you get away for a while? It's still lunch break. I've got at least half an hour before my next lesson. A short drive, then, to somewhere quiet. They parted when footsteps echoed along the corridor, and turned towards the stairs leading to the main entrance, saying nothing until they were outside, the sun warming them after the coolness of the school's interior. Where were you yesterday? Amy asked. I tried to reach you throughout the day. I thought you were showing Edouard Vigier around the island. There was no criticism in his response. I did for an hour or so. He understood my concern for you, though, and suggested we cut it short. I wasn't terribly good company, I'm afraid. They walked towards the car park. I came by the cottage, but there was no sign of you. I was so worried. I'm sorry, Amy. I should have realised. I just had to get away. I couldn't stay inside. Because of what happened at dinner? He nodded. I hardly ingratiated myself with your father. That's not important. I want to know the cause, John. She took his arm. It's starting all over again, Amy. I knew it that time on the beach. The feeling was the same. Like being somewhere else, watching. Seeing an action taking place and having no control over it. They had reached his car, and she noticed his hands were trembling as he fumbled with the keys. It might be a good idea if I did the driving, she suggested. He opened the car door and handed Amy the keys without argument. They headed away from the school, taking a nearby winding lane that led to the coast. She occasionally glanced at him while she drove, and his tenseness was soon passed on to her. They parked in a clearing overlooking a small bay, the sea below a sparkling blue, hued green in parts, lighter in the shallows. Through the open windows of the car they could hear the surf softly lapping at the shingle beach. In the far distance a ferry trundled through the calm waters towards the main harbour on the eastern side of the island. Childs watched its slow progress, his mind elsewhere, and Amy had to reach out and turn his face towards her. "'We're here to talk, remember?' she said. "'Please tell me what was wrong with you on Saturday.' She leaned forward to kiss him, and was relieved that his trembling had lessened. "'I can do better than that,' he told her. "'I can show you.' He reached over to the back seat and unfolded the newspaper before her. "'Take a look,' he said, pointing a finger. "'Infant's grave desecrated,' she said aloud, but the rest was read silently, disbelievingly. "'Oh, John!' This is horrible. Who could do such a thing? To dismember a child's corpse, to... She shuddered and jerked her head away from the open page. It's so vile. It's what I saw, Amy. She stared incredulously at him, her yellow hair curling softly over one shoulder. I was there at the graveside. I saw the body being torn open. I was part of it somehow. No, you couldn't have... He gripped her arm. I saw it all. I touched the mind of the person who did this. How? 
The question was left hanging in the air. Like before. Just like before. A feeling of being inside the person, seeing everything through their eyes. But I'm not involved. I've got no control. I can't stop what's happening. Amy was shocked by his sudden abject terror. She clung to him, speaking soothingly. It's all right, John. You can't be harmed. You're not part of it. What's happened has nothing to do with you. I had my doubts on that score the other night, he said, drawing away. I wondered if I were only recalling violence I committed myself. Certain acts my own mind had blanked out. He indicated the newspaper. This occurred on the mainland on the night I was at your home. At least that fact came as a relief. If only I could have been with you yesterday to knock that silly idea out of your head. No, I needed to be alone. Talking wouldn't have helped. Sharing the problem would have. He tapped his forehead. And the problem's inside here. You're not mad. He smiled grimly. I know that. But will I stay sane if the visions keep coming at me? You have to know what it's like, Amy, to understand how scary it becomes. I'm left ragged when it's over, as if a portion of my brain had been eaten away. Is that how you felt last time? In England, I mean. Yeah. Well, maybe it was worse then. It was a totally new experience for me. When they found the man responsible for those killings, what then? Relief. Incredible relief. It was as though a huge black awareness had been released. Something like, I'd imagine, when someone suffering from oversensitive hearing suddenly finds the overload has been blocked out, that their eardrums have finally managed the correct balance. Strangely, the release came before they tracked the man down. You see, somehow I knew the exact moment he committed suicide, because that was when my mind was set free. His death let me go. Why him? Why that particular murderer? And why only him? Have you ever wondered about that? I've wondered, and I've never reached a satisfactory conclusion. I've sensed things before, but nothing startling. Nothing you could describe as precognition or ESP, anything like that. They've always been mundane, ordinary stuff that I suppose most people sense. When the phone rings, you guess who's at the other end even before you pick it up. Or when you're lost, guessing the right turn to make. Simple, everyday matters, nothing dramatic. He shifted in the car seat, eyes watching a swooping gull. Psychics say our minds are like radio receivers, tuning into other wavelengths all the time, picking up different frequencies. Well, maybe he was transmitting on a particular frequency that only I could receive. The excitement he felt at the kill boosting the output, making it powerful enough to reach me. The gull was soaring upwards once more, its wings brilliant in the sun's rays. Childs twisted round to face Amy. It's a stupid theory, I know, but I can't think of any other explanation, he said. It isn't stupid at all. It makes a weird kind of sense. Strong emotions, a sudden shock, can induce a strong telepathic connection between certain people, and that's well known. But why now? What's triggered off these psychic messages this time? Childs folded the newspaper and tossed it onto the back seat. The same as before. I've picked up another frequency. You have to go to the police. Well, you've got to be kidding. That kind of publicity finished off my marriage and sent me scuttling for cover last time. Do you really imagine I'd bring it all down on myself again? And there's no alternative. Well, sure there is. I can keep quiet and pray that it'll go away. It didn't last time. As far as I know, nobody's been murdered yet. As far as you know. What happened the other week, when you saw something that shook you so much you nearly drowned? Just a confused jumble. Impossible to tell what was going on. Perhaps it was a killing. I, I can't ruin everything again by going to the law. What chance would I have at La Roche or the other schools if word got around that there was some kind of psychic freak teaching kids on the island? Victor Platnow is already gunning for me, and I'd hate to gift Rap more ammunition for him. Platnow? He quickly summarised his meeting with Estelle Piprelli. I think Daddy had a hand in this, she said when he had concluded. 
And did you tell your father about me? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that harshly. There's no reason for you to keep secrets from your family, so I wouldn't blame you if you had. He got the local police to look into your history. I had nothing to do with it. Childs sighed. I should have known. Anything to break us up, right? No, John. He's just concerned about who I get involved with, she half-lied. Oh, I can't blame him for getting upset. Acting a wimp doesn't suit you. She touched his lapel, her fingers running along its edge, a frown hardening her expression. I still think you should inform the police. You proved last time you weren't a crank. He held her moving fingers. Well, let's give it a bit more time, eh? These... these visions might just amount to nothing. Might fade away. Amy turned from him and switched on the ignition. We have to get back, she said. Then... What if they don't? What if they get worse? John, what if someone is murdered? He found he had nothing to say. Childs assumed his mock official voice when he heard Gabby's squeaky, Hello? Uh, to whom am I speaking to? he asked, for the moment pushing aside troubled thoughts. Daddy, she warned lowly, used to the game. Guess what happened in school today, Daddy? Let me see, he pondered. You shot the teacher, right? No. The teacher shot you lot? Be serious. He grinned at her frustration, imagining her standing by the phone, receiver pressed to her ear as if glued. Her glasses slipped to the end of her nose in their usual fashion. OK, you tell me, Squirt, he said. Well, first we brought our projects in and Miss Hart held mine up to the class and told everybody it was really good. Was that the one on wildflowers? Yes, I told you last week, she replied indignantly. Oh, yeah, it slipped my mind. Well, hey, that's great. She really liked it, eh? Yes. Annabelle's was nearly as good, but I think she copied me a little bit. I got a gold star for mine and Annabelle got a yellow one, which is very good, really. He chuckled. Well, I think it's marvellous. Then Miss Hart told us we were all going to Friends Park next Tuesday on a big coach, where they've got monkeys in cages and a big lake with boats and slides and things. Oh, they've got monkeys on a coach? No, at Friends Park, silly. Mummy said she'd give me some money to spend and make me up a picnic. Oh, that sounds lovely. Isn't she going with you? No, it's just school. Do you think the weather will be sunny? Well, I should think so. It's pretty warm now. I hope it will. So does Annabelle. Are you coming to see me soon? As usual, she threw in the question with innocent abandon, not knowing the tiny stab wound it caused. Yeah, I'll try, darling. Maybe at half term. Mummy might let you come over here to see me. On a plane? I don't like the boat. It's too long. It makes my tummy feel sick. Yes, on a plane. You could stay with me for a few days until term begins again. Can I bring Miss Puddles? She'd be very lonely without me. Miss Puddles was Gabby's pet, a black cat bought for her on her third birthday. The cat's development had easily outpaced his daughter's, kittenish behaviour giving way to imperious coolness long before Childs had left the household. No, that wouldn't be a good idea. Mummy will need someone to keep her company, won't she? He hadn't seen his daughter for almost six months, and he wondered how tall she'd grown. Gabby seemed to grow in sudden leaps, taking him by surprise each time he saw her. I suppose so, she said. Did you want to speak to Mummy? Uh, yes, please. She isn't here. Janet's looking after me. Oh, all right. Well, let me have a word with Janet. I'll go and fetch her. Oh, Daddy, I sprinkled glitter dust all over Miss Puddles yesterday to make her sparkly. I bet she liked that, he said, shaking his head and grinning. She didn't. She got really sulky. Mummy says we'll never get it out, and Miss Puddles keeps sneezing. Uh, get Janet to run the vacuum attachment over her. That should shift some of it, if you can keep the cat still for long enough. Gabby giggled. She's going to get cross. I'll tell Janet you want to speak to her, all right? Good girl. I love you, Daddy. Bye. As abrupt as that. Uh, I love you, he returned, hearing the phone clunk down before he'd completed the sentence. Running footsteps echoed away, her squeaky little voice called in the distance. More footsteps along the hall, heavier, and the receiver was picked up. Mr. Childs? Uh, how are things, Janet? OK, I guess. 
Fran's working late at the office this evening, so I'm staying until she gets home. I brought Gabby home from school, as usual. Uh, Any luck with the job yet? Not yet. We've got a couple of interviews next week, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Neither are really what I wanted, but anything's better than nothing. He sympathised. Janet was a bright teenager, although with few qualifications. With full-time employment so difficult to come by for the young and inexperienced, she had quite a struggle on her hands. Did you want to leave a message, Mr. Childs? Janet asked. Uh, no, it's OK. I'll probably call again tomorrow. I just wanted to chat with Gabby. I'll tell Fran you rang. Thanks. Uh, good luck for next week. I'll need it. Bye for now, Mr. Childs. The link was severed, and he was alone again in his cottage. At such times there was a brutal finality in the replacing of a receiver. His injured hand throbbed dully, and there was an unnatural dryness at the back of his throat. He stood by the telephone for some time, his thoughts slowly drifting away from his daughter and settling on the memory of the police detective who had been involved in the child-slaying case years before, whom he'd helped to track down the maniac killer. His fingers rested on the still-warm plastic, but he could not make them grip the receiver. Amy was wrong. There was no point in going to the police. What could he tell them? He couldn't identify the person who had dug up the dead boy, could give them no clues as to the desecrator's whereabouts. Until he had seen the morning paper, he'd had no idea even that the offence had taken place in England. He had assumed, if the sighting was a true one and not merely a fantasised image, that it had happened closer, somewhere on the island. There was nothing to say to the police. Nothing at all. He took his hand away from the phone. Gabby's birth had been difficult, a breach. She had come from the womb feet first and a purplish shade of blue, almost causing Childs, who had stayed by Fran's side throughout, to collapse with fear. He had felt that nothing looking like that, so shriveled and frail, so darkly coloured, could possibly live. The obstetrician had tilted the baby, drawing mucus from her mouth, having no time to reassure the parents, anxious only for the life of the child. He had cleared the blockage and blown hard against her slippery little chest to encourage breathing. The first cry, no more than a quietly pitched whimper and hardly heard, sent relief surging through them all, doctor, nurse and parents alike. She had been wrapped and placed on Fran's breast, the umbilical cord deftly cut, and Childs, as exhausted mentally as Fran was physically, had viewed them both with a spreading glow which transformed his weariness into a relaxed tiredness. Fran, her features wan and aged after the ordeal, the baby still wet and bloodied, her face screwed up and wrinkled like an ancient's, both so peaceful in the struggle's aftermath. He had leaned over them, careful not to crush, yet needing to be as close as possible, the sterile hospital smell mixing with the sweet odour of battle, and had thought then that nothing could ever disrupt their unity. Nothing could make them part. In the ensuing weeks, it was as though Gabby was slowly emerging from a deep and terrible trauma, as indeed she was, the transition between mere existence and dawning awareness. He had begun to understand the shock creation brought with it. Sleep laid claim to most of her life in those early days, releasing her in gentle episodes to absorb and learn, to sustain herself, and the transformation was fascinating to see. Her growing was a marvel to him, and he spent hours just observing, watching her develop, become a little girl who toddled on unsteady legs and who had a great affection for her own thumb and a ragged piece of material that had once been her blanket. Her first word had delighted him, even though it hadn't been Dada, and her unbounded reliance on him and Fran and her uncomplicated love had drawn from him a new tenderness that was reflected in other areas of his life. Gabby had made him understand the vulnerability of every living person and creature. A time-consuming career involved in machines and abstractions had tended to blunt that perception. 
The newfound compassion had nearly destroyed him when he had mind-witnessed the indecent destruction of the children. Three years later, the thought still haunted him, and just lately, their power to do so was greater than ever. Childs had spent the evening preparing exercises for the next day's lessons. The Tuesday afternoon he had promised to Miss Piprelli, and which had already come into practice. Examinations for the girls would soon be upon them, and computer studies would be won. He was irritated that his thoughts had kept wandering throughout the evening, thinking of Gabby, the years of happiness they had shared as a family, even though Fran had never completely laid to rest the ghost of her PR career. So much had happened to spoil that in such a short time, and the intervening years could not quite dispel the anguish of it all. He stared unseeingly at the papers spread before him, the shielded desk lamp casting deep shadows around the small living room. Was Gabby asleep by now, glasses folded next to her pillow for security? He glanced at his watch. Nearly half past nine. She had better be. Did Fran still read her a bedtime story, or was she too busy nowadays, too exhausted when she got home? Child shuffled the papers together, dismayed that some of the girls he had tested today with quick-fire questions still did not know the difference between analogue and digital computers, or that they could be combined in a hybrid. Simple, basic stuff that shouldn't have been a problem. He dreaded the exam results, hoping practice would prove more fruitful than theory. He ran a hand across weary eyes, his contact lenses feeling like soft grit against his pupils. Food, he thought. Ought to eat. They say it's good for you. So tired, though. Maybe a sandwich, a glass of milk. A stiff drink might be more beneficial. He was about to rise when something cold, numbing, stabbed at his mind. Childs put both hands to his temples, confused by the unexpected sensation. Blinking his eyes, he tried to rid himself of the coldness. It persisted. Outside, he could hear the night breeze stirring the trees. A floorboard cracked somewhere inside the house, a timber settling after the warmth of the day. The numbness faded, and he shook his head as if dizzy. Too much paperwork, he told himself. Too much concentration far into the night. Concentration disturbed by thoughts of Gabby. And other things. That drink might relax him. He rose, pressing down on the desktop to heave himself up. The icicle touched nerves once more, and he swayed, hands gripping the sides of the desk to steady himself. His thoughts were jumbled, tumbling over each other in his head, the iciness now like probing fingers pushing through those thoughts, taking them and somehow, somehow feeding upon them. His shoulders hunched and his head bowed. His lips drew back as though he were in pain, yet there was no hurt, just the spreading numbness and the mental chaos. A groan escaped him. And then his mind began to clear. He remained standing, leaning over the desk, breathing heavily, allowing the sensation to subside. It seemed to take a long while, but Childs knew it was no more than seconds. He waited until his quivering nerves had settled before crossing the room and pouring himself a drink. Strangely, the whiskey was almost tasteless. He choked on the next swallow as the burning flavour came back at him at full strength. Spluttering, he wiped the back of his arm against his lips. What the hell was happening to him? He tasted the drink again, this time more carefully, sipping slowly. He was warmed. Childs looked around the room uneasily, not sure of what he was searching for, merely feeling another presence. Foolish. Apart from him, the room was empty. Nobody had crept in while he had been hunched over paperwork. The shadows thrown by the metal desk lamp made him uncomfortable, and he went to the switch by the door, bandaged hand outstretched to turn on the overhead light. He stopped before touching the switch and stared at his fingers, surprised by the sudden tingling in them, as if they had received a mild electric shock. 
they had not touched the light switch. He glanced down when the peculiar tingling began in the hand clutching the whisky glass, and it seemed as so though the glass itself was vibrating. The unseen insidious fingers probed again. His body sagged, and he quickly sank onto the nearby sofa, pushing into its softness as if trying to evade a pressing weight. The glass fell to the floor, the rug soaking up its spilled contents. Charles's eyes closed as the sense of intrusion became intense. Images whirled inside his head. Computer matrixes, faces, the room he was in now, numbers, symbols, floating in and out, something white, shimmering, past events, his own face, his own self, his fears, dreams long forgotten, recalled and pried into. He moaned pushing away the delving ice tentacles, forcing a calmness in his mind, willing the confusion to stop. Childs's muscles relaxed a little when the cold probing faded once again, his chest rising and falling in exaggerated motion. He stared blankly at the shadows cast against the opposite wall. Something was attempting to reach him. Something, some body was trying to know him. With scarcely any relief, the creeping sensation came back, tautening his body, infiltrating his consciousness. No! his mind screamed, and no! he cried aloud. But it was there, inside, searching, sucking at his thoughts. He could feel its existence, delving into him like some psychic thief. It invaded him and dwelt on thoughts of the island, the schools he taught in, thoughts of Amy, of Fran, of Gabby, of Gabby. It seemed to linger. Childs forced himself off the sofa, struggling against the extraneous consciousness, painfully dislodging each numbing tentacle as though they were physical entities. He felt their grip loosen, and the effort sent him to his knees. He made himself think only of a white mist, nothing else, nothing to distract him nor give sustenance to the intruder. And soon his head began to clear. But before relief came fully, leaving him crouched and shivering on the floor, he heard a sound so real it caused him to twist his head and search the dark corners of the room. He was alone, but the low snickering seemed close. Jeanette was late. The other girls from her dormitory had already gone down, and she was still in her dressing gown, furiously brushing her teeth. Today of all days, exams, maths, ah, maths. Jeanette sometimes wondered if she were a bonehead as far as figures were concerned. Morning sunlight poured into the washroom, reflecting off the rows of porcelain basins, making them gleam. Water gathered in small pools on the tiled floor, liquid debris from the girls' washing rituals. She was alone, and preferred to be. The others often embarrassed her by comparing breast sizes and shapes, all of them eager competitors in the development race. Jeanette was a long way behind most of the other thirteen- and fourteen-year-olds in her class, and did not care much for the comparisons. To add to her feelings of inadequacy, her periods had not even started yet. Jeanette rinsed her mouth, spat into the basin, dabbed her lips with a face cloth, and dumped her toiletries into her pink plastic wash bag. She padded to the door, bare feet nearly slipping on the wet tiles, then hurried along the gloomy corridor, leaving damp footprints on the polished floorboards in her wake. Bare feet were forbidden inside the school, but she had not had time to rummage beneath her bed for skulking slippers, and besides, Everyone, staff included, would be downstairs by now, tucking into breakfast. It was shivery in the dormitory she shared with five other girls, despite the bright sun outside, and Jeanette quickly laid out her underwear, plain, regulation, navy-blue panties and white vest, on the narrow, rumpled bed. Shrugging off her quilted dressing gown, she pulled her pyjama top off over her head, without undoing the buttons, and threw it onto the bed alongside the underwear. She briskly rubbed at the sudden goose pimples on her arms, as if to brush them off, then reached for the vest. Before pulling on the garment, she paused to examine her chest and sighed at its complacency. The nipples were longish, erect now because of the chill, but the tiny mounds they thrust from were, as usual, a disappointment. 
She tweaked the nipples to make them harder and tugged at the soft bumps to encourage growth. A delicate flush of pleasure warmed her, and she imagined her breasts had swelled a little more. She sat on the bed, still in her pyjama bottoms, and cupped a mound in each hand. It felt pleasant, and she wondered what it would be like if... No, no time for that. She was late enough already. She stripped off the pyjama legs and swiftly donned vest, panties, and white socks retrieved from the bottom drawer of her bedside locker. Since the weather had changed for the better, La Roche girls were allowed their light blue, short-sleeved summer dresses, and Jeanette shrugged on hers, shoes badly in need of a polish following. She tidied the bed, hiding her nightwear beneath the sheets, then grabbed a brush and attacked her long, tangled hair, wincing at her efforts. The small, blue-rimmed mirror, a china butterfly frozen on one top corner, standing on top of the locker, reflected the results which were not pleasing. In spite of her haste, Jeanette leaned close and examined her face for overnight blemishes. She had almost entirely cut out chocolate, and did her utmost, puke-making though it was, to finish off all the green vegetables on her dinner plate. But the spots came up with predictable regularity, and nearly always on special occasions. But there... Today wasn't special, only rotten exams, and her skin was clear. She bet that on her wedding day there would be at least five zits to every square inch of flesh on her face, and she'd have to wear a veil all through the ceremony, and she'd be afraid to lift it afterwards for her husband's kiss, and when she eventually did, she would look like an ice cream topped with raspberry pips.